His prophetic gift, in my estimation, and I've been with the best, is the best of the best, the most accurate in seeing the hearts of men and women and predicting the future to the extent that the Lord will allow him to share, he shares. He's in demand all over the world, but flies under the radar on purpose so that he can have the trust of penetrating the leadership infrastructures of countries. Um, he's been in South Africa where the guards actually came forward as he stepped towards the prime minister and broke the ice as he shared a prayer and a prophecy, which then amazed the leaders of that country, which prompted founder of Pastor Rice Brooks to look at Jim. He says, I sure glad you practiced this at home because we were gonna be dead. He's been in situations like that, most recently also in the Philippines, which is in chaos in different parts of the country. And we are privileged to have him not only as a speaker, as a prophet, but as friend and family, we now serve on the global leadership oversight team in our every nation family of churches. He has charted the course prophetically of our last 20 years, of our 25 years. Pieces of that are coming together in convergence. And today, in this year of our 25th month of marking 25 years and looking ahead, He's back with us. This is our Captain America, Prophet Jim LaFoon. Will you stand to your feet and welcome Jim. All right, hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Norman. I'm more like Mr. Incredible when he got fat trying to get in his suit, but that's okay. All righty. Okay, now let me explain this because oh, I've had no. many people... In a previous life, Jim LaFoon jumped out of airplanes. He was, in, he was part of the 82nd Airborne Division, and so he jumped during the Vietnam area into hot spots in Southeast Asia as a paratrooper. Therefore, because winds would carry the, the chute in unpredictable directions sometimes, you land awkwardly and affects your knees, much like Tony Holyfield, who limps because of decades of playing football, including professional football. He's had replacements, but we want to preserve those knees for the next 25 years so he can keep coming back. And I hear an MN in the house. And so now he sits just like you're sitting as he preaches. Jim, Thank you, Pastor home. Norman. How many of we love Pastor Norman? Pastor Norman and I, we're growing old together. I'm just the only one that will admit it. I've turned 65 in September. He's soon to catch me in November. Whenever I try to call him, I say, hey, old friend. He goes, no, hey, old young friend. I said, there's certain things you can't confess away, Pastor Norman. Father time is one of them. As for why I said it is true, I did jump out of airplanes. It is true. I did kind of mess up a knee in the military. But the real reason is in 60, one of my friends said, you're getting older, you ought to try sitting. I like so much, I kept doing it. Okay, all righty. I'm just honestly privileged to be here. I always love coming home to spiritual family. I've been to the Hawaiian Islands probably over 50 times. And um, it's always great to be here. So happy anniversary to you here at Pearl Side, your 25th anniversary. As I've prayed, the Lord's been speaking to me about your past, which I've had the joy of sharing in 20 years of those, and your future. I've never shared this word before, and I've been preaching since I was 17. You do the math, that's a good while. And um, I'm gonna entitle this message, Centered. A Couple of reasons, I wanna help you get centered on the will of God for this house. And then I wanna subtitle it, you're a church to the city, you're also processing toward becoming a center to the world. Now, why is it so important for you as an individual to know what the destiny of this church is like? Why would that matter? Here's why that matters. Because if God joined you to this church and you're a part of it, which many of you are, maybe some of you are visiting and this is your first time here, that's why we don't really join churches. God joins them to us. And the reason he joins us is many times what we don't realize is we too have a purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says we're God's workmanship in Christ. Not only is he working on us, he's prepared works for us to do in advance. That means you're here for a reason. And God joins you to the church where you can best discover and be developed for the purpose for which you were born. And many times 
your purpose is reflected in the divine purpose of your church. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you for this great church. My heart is always just blessed to be here. Thank you for their sacrifices, their love for you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd speak to us. Just let me put this church in perspective for you a moment. There's about 350,000 churches in the 50 states of America. Maybe more. They say 350 now. Who knows? Maybe 375. It just depends who you read. But out of that 350 to 375,000 churches, there are about 2,000 churches that have at least 2,000 people in attendance, which I might add, you have five, far more on your sites. So you're sitting in one of the largest churches in America, one of the largest churches in the state of Hawaii. How did that happen? 25 years ago when Norman and Faye and some others decided they'd reach this area. I think when I look at this church, the church in the Bible that this most reminds me of and the one the Spirit spoke to me to use, Spirit of God, is the church in Antioch. It was a church that not only had tremendous growth within their city, they ended up being a group of people, some of which the people that started it were islanders from Cyprus. In fact, the man that pastored it was from Cyprus. They began to touch the world. How did that happen? What gave that church such influence? I think there are many things, but I want to say two of them because I see them at work here, and I want to mention them before we spring into the future because we don't want to lose them. One was risk. They're risk takers. I mean by that, they followed God's word and spirit even when it was risky. So in Acts 11, 19 through 20, there had been a terrifying persecution. Stephen, one of the young leaders in the Jerusalem church, had been brutally stoned. And a terrible persecution had sprang up in Jerusalem, and they were running and fleeing everywhere. The neat thing was, in reality, they were being sent. It was just called being scattered. The difference in being sent and scattered is if you're sent, you're sent out by your church. If you're scattered, you're running from persecution. Yet they preached wherever they went. There's those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists. What's that mean? They preached to non-Jews. You ought to be glad most of us in this room are non-Jews. We're Gentiles. Now this was amazing because up until that time, the church in Jerusalem was still skeptical of preaching to Gentiles. Peter had done it at the household of a Roman centurion, but still they wondered. And all of a sudden, there's this explosive growth among Gentiles. It was a risk. What would the rest of the church say? It's always the risk when you step out beyond the norm. I mean, the church in Jerusalem, when they heard, it says when the report came to their ears, that means they were wondering. We better send Barnabas down to check this out. But they weren't just risk takers in who they reached. They were risk takers in who led. So in Acts 11, 25 through 26, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for a man named Saul. Who was this Saul? He was the most infamous Christian on the planet. He had led horrible persecutions against them. Men, women in prison killed. He had stood rejoicing over the death of Stephen. When he'd been radically saved, no one wanted to believe it. In fact, a man named Ananias, an unknown man in the church, ended up discipling. Why Ananias? No leader in the church would have touched him. He'd hidden out three years in Arabia, began to preach, had to leave their Lord in a basket, and went to Jerusalem. They didn't trust him. No one to meet with him. Too bad a history, too bad a reputation. But a man named Barnabas, who was a businessman from Cyprus, who when God touched, he became a prophet. And now he's leading this church in just citywide revival and hundreds and thousands of people are being saved. And he realizes, I'm at a leadership bottleneck. And he remembers, what about that man named Saul? It's true, he's infamous. 
No one touches him. Some wonder if he's really a spy. But I remember him telling me, I'm called to the Gentiles. There was no Google. There was no mobile phone. Could not just pick up the phone and call him. He left the middle of revival, left his young church, and went and hunted down Saul in Tarsus. Saul felt given up on. No one trusted him. No one believed he could really lead. They took a risk. And when they deployed Saul, the church exploded in even more growth. It was amazing what God did. In fact, it says that when Saul got there, the discipleship was so deep, the city itself said, they must be Christians. They must be little Christ. There's such character in them. Now, I want to stop and say at the very foundation of this church, there's risk-taking. When Norman and Faye and the team came, they reached one of the youngest harvests ever seen. Norman jokes about the spiritual warfare and the demonic and the brokenness. Like they reached an untargeted group in this city. And you're living in the results today. And that heart to take risk, to believe God, to start things, to plant things. It's just amazing to see what God has done. To reach out for a site, to reach out, as Norman has mentioned, into the highest political community of the land. I, I've seen your pastor in meetings that I cannot even talk about. Is the great leaders in your state cry and he's discipled them and been used of God with them. There's always been a risk-taking spirit here. And out of that risk is come an unusual reach. An unusual reach on the campus. An unusual reach in the high school. And there's always been a culture where we'll promote someone young. You look at the incredible young leaders just coming up around this church. Credible young men and women. Why? There's a culture which says God's anointing is not limited by age. That God can anoint a college student. That God can anoint a high school student. There are some of you out here, I want to speak to you very specifically. You're in your Tarsus. You've known the call of God on your life. For some of you, there's a vocational call for ministry, and you can feel it. There's a couple that walked in here today. You've been here before. You've known the call of God. You've been on church staff, but there was a burnout and an explosion, and you feel stuck now. You're in a house that takes a risk on the young. You're in a house that'll take a risk on people that have known failure and burnout. There's something in our culture. We see men and women with God's hand. Yes, they have to be proven. Yes, they have to be faithful but it's our culture. It's what we're called to do. And I wanna say that when it comes to risk, when it comes to risk, we've not stopped. There's another harvest coming here. I was sitting with some of your leaders yesterday and the Holy Spirit began to describe a harvest to me. And there's a harvest that's coming to this church. Yes, it'll touch all demographics, but it'll also be one of the youngest harvest part of it you've ever seen. You've seen high school students touched, college students touched, all ages, demographics, older people like Norman and myself. But I'm here to tell you right now, you will see a junior high harvest. You're going to see 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 6-year-olds, 6th graders, 7th graders, 8th graders touched by the Holy Spirit. You're going to see a burgeoning harvest on the middle schools. You're going to see small group leaders at 12 years old. You need disciple makers at 11 years old. Imagine when they get to high school. Imagine when they get to college. Imagine touching a generation before porn crushes them. Touching a generation before they're into self-harm. Touching a generation before they're broken down. And as you continue to believe, as you continue to risk, as you continue to reach out, it'll be amazing to see what God will do. Your number of sites, will, they'll grow. You'll plant more churches. Yet, you won't just continue to reach this city. God's called you to be a center to the world. What's that mean? What's that like? Let's take a look just at the next five years. Let's not go beyond that. What does it mean when God 
finds a people who will be used to touch the world. What does it mean when God just finds an ordinary group of men and women and decides he's not just going to touch their lives or their city or their community, he's going to touch their world. What's that like? How's that happen? What's it feel like and why is it important for you? In Acts eleven twenty seven through 30, you find that the first, what's the right word, indicator that this church is not just going to be a church, it's going to be a center. Some prophets come down. One of them was a man named Abigus, and he stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. Crops were going to fail. And they go on, the scripture goes on to say, it really took place in the days of the Emperor Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Their response was not to hoard. Their response was to give. In fact, they were giving to their Jewish brothers and sisters in Judea who didn't even really trust them. So they didn't just cross geographic lines, they cross demographic lines. And here you find, here's a group of people, maybe themselves going to face famine, they reach out to touch the world. This is the first indicator that God had a people here who weren't just about themselves, they're about his purpose. Now when you come to Acts 13, 1 through 4, and we examine that, you're going to find really the birthing of this church. I spoke Saturday night and didn't talk about what I'm going to talk about now. I got back to my hotel. I literally felt the Holy Spirit begin to stir in me. And as he did, he said, son, what I'm doing here, a sermon's not going to do it. A consultant's great. It's more than just sermon and visions and videos of the past. I'm going to birth these people into something. I'm getting ready to bring them as individuals and a church into the second level of the destiny they were born for. So I've been here for 20 years. I can remember looking off in the future and talking about church planning. But what we've been looking into is now coming upon us. There were the, in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. This was kind of like their senior council. Barnabas, Jewish businessman from Cyprus, gave a massive financial gift that shook up the giving in Jerusalem. They discovered he was a prophet. His name had been Joseph. Now he was Barnabas, son of encouraged, son of prophecy. Simeon, who was called Niger, a man from North Africa. Lucius of Cyrene and uh, Manion, lifelong friend of Herod the Tetart. That means he was the king's companion, the king's friend. He grew up with a man who ordered John the Baptist murdered. He grew up with a man Herod, who would judge Jesus, now in his 60s, radically saved, one of the most powerful men in the region serving Christ. And they were Saul. And they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. I didn't know you were going to be fasting in just a few days until, until I walked into the church this morning and looked at the bulletin. But I'll tell you, what I'm talking about is not just birth in worship. It's not just birth in prayer. It is birth in fasting. They were fasting. You see, when you fast, your heart softens. When you worship, you become open. And I imagine they were seeking God for direction. I mean, they had ideas. They had inklings. Paul knew he was called to the Gentiles. And as they were fasting, it's like they got on the catapult of an aircraft carrier. And as they were fasting, God spoke these words. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart. Now these are powerful words, beloved. The word set apart means to mark off by boundaries. To treat them differently. To put them in a different zone. To relate, the Holy Spirit says, set apart. They go, wait a minute, that's like serious. That means change is coming for someone. That means what they do for you, how you know, how you, I mean, it's different. And then it got worse. Set apart for me 
Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I've called them. This had to be stunning. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to church where you had Barnabas and the Apostle Paul as your, as your prophet and teacher? That's not bad. He said, from this day forth, you're going to have a different relationship with Barnabas and Saul. Set them apart for the work I've called them to. For them, what did that mean? That didn't mean they were going to travel a bit more and you were going to see them on Sundays. That meant they were going to go off on long journeys. Everything was going to change. We live in a world where you can be set apart and sent and still get back home a lot. That wasn't their reality. Set them apart. And you're coming into a time where leaders in this church will be set apart. Well, I'll leave the who to God. They'll be set apart. You may not see them as much. You may go, man, that was my favorite preacher. I love being pastored. Oh, I loved her. I love that couple. What set apart means? That means God may send them to another site, to a church plant, to another island, to another state, to another country. Who? That's God's business. I don't want to speculate. Set them apart. What if it's you God sets apart? What if one day you'll go to another site? What if one day God will send you to a church plant? Set them apart. Then they went from being set to sent. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there, they sailed to Cyprus. That means you're coming into a time in your church where God's going to set people apart, women, men, couples, and then he's going to send them. Now, this whole concept of sending is critical in a center. See, there's two ways God deploys people. He calls them, and when God initiates, humans confirm or he sends them, humans initiate, God confirms. Paul knew he had been called to the Gentiles a long time. Simmered it and burned it, and he knew he was called to Gentile nations. Now was his moment. I'll never forget sitting in a church at the ripe old age of 22. 22 years old. A prophet came, I was sitting in the church, the back of the church, I was making a big salary of $140 a month. I got out of the army making $660 a month, eating free. My pastor offered me 100, I said 140. I started a small group with 28 married couples so I could eat. There I was, and a prophet came through. He called me up, thus saith the Lord, you'll go through the nations of the world. You'll be leaving this place. My pastor goes, ah, we'll see. I mean, you're not ready, you're immature, you're young, you're stupid. I mean, you've never, ever planted a church. Two months later, he was on a worldwide trip, went to the island of Mindanao where there was a war. And God says, you need to send Jim LaFoon here to start a church planter school who had never, ever planted a church. The night he came back, I dreamed I was surrounded by Asians. I didn't know they were Filipinos. Two months later, I'd been sent to a war zone to start a church planter school when I'd never started a church. They killed people in my street. War everywhere. But I was so thankful that I'd come out of the military. They invited me into their jungle school. I preached in their jungle warfare school. The whole class but one was saved. Helicopters would roll in. They said, do you want to take a jump with me? I said, I'm done, done jumping. I better preach. I drew my line of jumping there. Anyway, a different story. Now, so the fact of it is, beloved, he sent me. Man, I was least likely. I mean, no one thought it was going to be old, loud, dumb, young Jim LaFoon. No one knew then that the young man who slipped into Mindanao would one day stand before the president of the Philippines cabinet and tell that story and preach to them and prophesy. No one knew that what might happen do not underestimate what happens when you're in a center to the world. Do not underestimate what happens when God reaches out and sends you. It's hands off. That was my friend, Pastor. That was my best buddy. I can't believe they're moving 
How could that stupid prophecy come? I can't believe, I mean, they brought me into the church. I've always known them. I love their message. Set them apart. Set them apart. Your greatest years are ahead. You say, man alive, who's God going to send? Might be you. You got to be kidding me. I'm like a lifetime Hawaii boy. Give me a... We got spam wraps back there. I've got so much food back there, I'm almost in a carb shock coma. Every time I go back, there's more. It's Hawaii. It's the aloha spirit. And that's the aloha spirit, and I need an anoha spirit. But anyway, there I am. How's this work? Isaiah is in a deep time of worship. First few chapters. He's just gripped by the pain of his nation. All of a sudden, the presence of God swoops in, and he's one of the only humans until Jesus gave the Great Commission to hear what God's always saying. Who shall we send? Who will go for us? Who will go to their neighbor, go to their community, go to their school, go to the house of God, Go to a new site. Lead a small group. Plant a church. Go as, who will go for us? He hears the Trinity in conversation. Who will go for us? Who will we send? He had no idea where he'd be going, no idea where he'd be sent. He raises and says, I will go. Send me. And at the essence of ascending center is ascending people willing to send and be sent. I'm not qualified. I was not qualified when I went to Mindanao. I mean, loud, filled with pride, young. But God used me mightily there. Other than almost dying, it was great. <laughs> Liver destroyed and going through the jungle and one of them would get kidnapped. One of them. I mean, other than that, it was a great trip though. If God can use me, he can use you. You're privileged to be in a place that's not just going to touch the Pearl Site area. It's going to touch the world. Now, what's the danger of that? When we're part of a people like that, what's that mean? What happens? What's it like? If you've played sports and done things, you realize when you extend a member, extend a leg, or you get a bit off balanced, you risk your joints. A couple of my sons were good football players, and one of them was just a brutal middle linebacker, and you know, on the way, two, there'd be two-way starter, team captain, California football powerhouse, all of it off to college, and his junior year, he extended his arm when someone was, when he was to make a hit and he couldn't get his body in front of it, and literally we thought he separated his shoulder. He went back in the second half and made nine more tackles, I might add. That's a proud father, sorry. But in reality, he ripped the labrum off his bone. They couldn't reattach it. PGA surgeon tried, Titan surgeon, because when it got extended, and a lot of times the same thing happens in a church, it's when a church extends it's when a church sends. It's when a church reaches that they expose their joints. And when it comes to a church, those are relational joints. And when a church begins to be th threaten the enemy, he will attack the relational joints. He will attack the joining of that church because he realizes if he can't divide them, hurt them, separate them, they're going to damage his kingdom. Now it's interesting, the one relationship most secure you would have thought. I mean, the two best friends, a father-son relationship. The one relationship at the very center of this revival was destroyed by the enemy. Destroyed. I mean, the men that were leading it, the men that would 
stand and support what God was doing in the Gentile world. The men that would go from the Jerusalem council. Before I examine them, let me say that the last thing I want to say before I examine them and cut a little deeper is this church seized every opportunity. Nimble, quick. The minute they were sent, they were in a massive power encounter. Why do I say they seized opportunities? It's because when doors open in the spirit, they're not forever. It's not just the property you could lose. It's not just a sight. God opens doors, and if we're not nimble, well, this is our mentality, we miss them. But how'd they separate? I mean, how did it end for Paul and Barnabas? How did two best friends, the key leaders in the sending center for the world, I mean, how do you separate from your spiritual father? I mean, how could it happen? Barnabas had believed in Saul when no one else did. Barnabas had stood for him, believed for him. When he was out of vocational ministry, making tents in despair, Barnabas, how did it happen? How did it happen? We, store, we find the story in Acts 15, 36 to 40. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, that's really the root of the problem. When they went out, Barnabas was telling Paul, or Saul, now Paul was telling Barnabas. The disciple had grown up and become the leader. Barnabas was now following him. So he just, well, man, I knew him when he was a persecutor. And now he's my leader. And when we go into ascending mode, things happen fast. Things happen to a staff where someone who was once a young campus minister is now the leader. Or someone that had a position is now following him. Or in the church, people you remember being saved are now leaders. And you're going to a small group and they're the leader with someone you discipled. Things happen. Barnum is already unhappy. But the fuse had been lit. His name was John. It was Barnabas' nephew. And to be honest, he was a flake. I mean, he was known as a coward. He was in good company. A lot of people were cowards in those days, just like today. Risking your life's not a simple matter. They were in the garden. He was there. He'd followed the disciples in his bathrobe. The Last Supper had been in his mama's house, probably. And when Jesus, they came to take Jesus, he ran so fast the guards grabbed his robe, he was naked running out of the place. Barnabas had mercy on him and took him with the Apostle Paul on their first missionary journey. When the power encounter came, he ran and went home. Paul had had it. Paul, I'd like to bring my, my favorite nephew, John. He's a flake. He's a coward. We're not bringing him. The Bible says they argued so sharply they separated. By the way, later Paul wanted young John, who was Mark, and wrote the book of Mark. Barnabas was right and wrong. Friendship destroyed. The enemy will do what it takes to separate you. My kid wasn't treated right. Man, it just wasn't fair what happened to him. They hurt me. Beware of it. Because when a church extends, it's not the same. It's too big. The man that pastored me is gone. Oh, my disciple is gone. Everything's changing around here. I don't like change. Quite honestly, who cares what we like? It's immaterial. You say, that's harsh. No, that's biblical. I don't care what I like. I do care what God likes. And as for my plans, none of them are sacred. I've learned that. I got saved today. The only thing sacred to God is his plans, not yours. Now, where do we find the strength to walk these things out? How does God take a people and use them like this? Man, it's a privilege. The majority of churches in America never get to see what you see. This endless parade of young leaders you see getting on this stage they're here because you chose to reach young people. I sat 
in a room filled with young leaders and young couples from this church and some older yesterday morning. I've been coming here 20 years. I've never seen a room of leaders that surpasses what I saw yesterday in potential. I've seen is great. You know why? Because you reach young people. It's not like they were the best members in other churches that transferred over here. That, we love that when it happens. Majority of them came out of brokenness, hurt. It was kind of like the newlywed show. They, they're all been married such a short time. I thought, who's next behind door number one? I mean, everybody was young. But you realize most churches are aging. There's not young people. There's not young leaders coming up. The average mega church buys leaders. They don't birth them. They just get enough money to poach them out of other churches. That's okay, I guess. We don't do that here. We birth them. Sons, daughters. What sustains that? How is that constructed? How does that happen? It describes Barnabas in Acts 11, 23 and 24 as a good man who is full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. I'm going to start with faith and take the Holy Spirit in a minute. Full of faith. How do you get full of faith? And in life you really need it. My wife and I have fought for dying children. She's had cancer twice. My liver was destroyed. Had autoimmune disease they could never figure out. Told me in my 30s to quit the ministry for two years and maybe I'd make it. How do you stay full of faith? How's that happen? You see, in reality, faith is the fruit of something. Do you understand that? We know from Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from something. It doesn't just appear. It's not like the angels have a, a faith wand and the faith fairy comes down and taps your head while you're sleeping. No. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. That faith comes through your, through your what? Through your interaction with the word. The preached word, the spoken word, speaking it yourself, reading it, confessing it. When you're battling thoughts, you respond by speaking the word. And all of a sudden, you're in the middle of a fight, and the word comes to you. You say, Jim, why does the word come to you so much? Because I've read it a bunch. Well, my God, the word never comes to me. Maybe you should read it more. No, I'm not being, uh, no, I'm just being practical. This thing, having faith is a consequence. Some people have a gift of faith. Norman does, and it works for things outside of him. But the rest of us, faith is a consequence of a lifestyle in the word. Then he says, he was filled with the spirit. That means he was filled with God, filled with the spirit, filled with the gifts of the spirit. It says in Ephesians 5, man, don't get drunk on anything but the Holy Spirit. If you want to say drunk on the Holy Spirit, then it gives all the different ways of worshiping in English and worshiping in hymns and worshiping in songs and worshiping in the gifts of the spirit. So a life of the word and worship is what sustains what you're called to do. I gotta tell you this story before I summarize this. I was in Maui recently. I was speaking and my schedule had been exhausting. It's been a, 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 just a lot of tough spiritual battle this year. I was like 45 or 50 days on antibiotics with a deep infection they couldn't fix. And it was so much so that I took my second sabbatical in 45 years of vocational ministry, 11 days to pray. I mean, I appreciate sabbaticals. I'm just not much into them. So I took my big, long 11-day sabbatical. I was exhausted, but I've realized getting a vacation from something is not going to fix it in the end. Typically, you're exhausted not just by what you're doing, you're exhausted by what you're not doing. Do you understand that? And that if you don't stay connected with Christ, no vacation will save you. It's the life of God. It's the strength of God. 
I live in vacation. I even believe in days off. I like sports. My Yankees play it too. God have mercy on Paris and I. But how do we do this deal? How? I'm sitting in Maui and the Lord comes to me. He says, listen, I got to be honest. I'm going to tell you what he told me. He said, we've been friends a long time. You love me. You've walked with me. I'm not mad, but I'm going to tell you, your current level of spiritual discipline is not giving you the sense of my spirit and presence you need to sustain the work I've called you to do, the war you're facing. That's why you're exhausted, son. Yes, he had to adjust the fact that I'm not real big on days off and I'm trying to be really faithful to take a day off every week. I'm doing my best. But in reality, my outflow was greater than my inflow. And what I was facing and what I was doing was draining me because I wasn't taking in enough. It's just the reality. It's reality for every person in this room. You can't do this. You'll never be the dad you want, the mom you want, the parent you want, the significant other you want, the spouse you want, the professional you want, the employee you want, the employer you want, the Christian you want without the help of God. You can't do it. And as long as I've walked with God, going up in the Christian home I grew up, you'd think I'd learn. But if not careful, I'll coast on my reserves. I don't mean I go a day without praying. I mean, I don't spend the time. And make no mistake about it, I'm not paid to pray. You don't pay me to minister to God. That's the responsibility of every Christian. That's long before I was in vocational ministry, I was ministering to God. When I was a young sergeant in the 82nd Airborne Division, I was ministering to God and making disciples and leading men to Christ. What sustains this church is the life of God flowing into every member. God's used you to reach this city. You're not the only great church in this city. It's, there's a great churches in here. God's used you to reach colleges before others even really thought about it. You've taken risk. And another great harvest is coming your way. But it's not just about your community, your city, your kids, and your beautiful island. It's about the world and the mainland and people you've never met and may never meet whose lives were different you say today, I want everything God has for me in this church, raise your hand right now. If your hands are up, stand to your feet. I'm going to pray with you right now. You say, I want God's full will for my life. I want you to pray this. Lord Jesus, I embrace your will. I embrace your calling on my life and on this church. Now I'm gonna give you a dangerous prayer. It may be one of the most dangerous prayers in the Bible. It's the prayer Isaiah prayed. If you're quickened, I want you to pray. I'm gonna say it again. Say this, Lord Jesus, send me. I'll go. Send me. I'll go. Let me close. I said those words, young Lord never realizing where it would take me, what it would mean. Look back now over decades, yes, war, yes, suffering, yes, pain. It's worth it all. I stand here with my family today, spiritual family in Hawaii, brothers, my sisters, sons, daughters, 
so honored to be in your presence and their presence. And we say together as we look out now at the next 25 years, send us, we'll go. Lord, and if, if you were willing to take the risk on a young 22-year-old soldier that no one really saw much potential in out of the military, waiting around, what might you do with anyone else who says, send me? I'll go. Help us to continue to be a great light in this city and a center to the world.